that violence against women is wrong, you can help prevent domestic violence. For tips on what to say, visit www.endabuse.org. End Abuse. Teach early. This message is brought to you by the Ad Council and the Family Violence Prevention Fund. All right, back here on KPOO and KPOO.com, if you're streaming this around the globe. Uh, very excited to have Liberty Bradford Mitchell. Thank you so much for coming in. Thank you, Derek. Can you get a little closer to it? I know that everything is oh, tricky Derek, here. Yep. That's perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, again, if I fail to uh, mention something that's important to this, you have a play coming out, a performance piece that we should be talking about. And if I forget to mention anything, just go ahead, cut me off. But... Uh, the name of this performance, what exactly are you calling it? A play? It's a play. Okay. It's a one-woman show. Okay, one-woman show. It's called The Pornographer's Daughter. It's going to be at Z Below, which is uh, 470 Florida Street in San Francisco. And uh, that takes place from the 17th of January through the uh, February 16th. And uh, this is about you, your life, but most people associate you as the daughter of Artie Mitchell, one half of the Mitchell brothers, the famous pornographers entrepreneurs, um, kind of staples of the San Francisco sex industry. Yes, absolutely. In the 70s, the O'Farrell Theater was the home base of the right. family. Now, was that the first uh, gentleman's club in San Francisco or the oh, most no. successful one? <laughs> I think it was just a very a very notorious one right. in its day. But no, there had been gentlemen's clubs for a long time before that. Okay. I, I, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> um, but yes, they're definitely pioneers in the adult film industry. And one of the coolest things about your father and his uncle were that they kind of defended against um, some pretty landmark obscenity trials and yes. they were victorious in all of them or yes wow okay so i mean everything from like being able to have a, um, a public sex show and and also showing off their films behind the green door which was one of their right. more uh, popular ones they defended against all of those and they were all right they time and again they would get my father was arrested uh, 187 times in wow. his career. Oh and <laughs> so every time they had a new show or whatever, the Vice Squad would bust them and nothing ever 187 stuck. times. Yeah. <laughs> and were the, I mean, I hate to ask, were these all misdemeanors or felonies or... Um, it's, it's a just, lot of bailing out. It is. They spent a lot of money on legal fees. <laughs> there's, wow. there's no doubt about it. But again, nothing. They never were convicted. Um, never. But there was a lot of... Uh, you know, a, a lot of time going in and out of the uh, jailhouse. So they were essentially harassed by the police. And I know uh, at the time, Mayor Feinstein, yes, she was big into their uh, downfall. Correct. <laughs> and, she wasn't uh, very successful with that. She wasn't. And they managed to get her personal phone number <laughs> and would put it on their marquee saying, for showtimes, call Mayor, me. Fe- call Mayor Feinstein. Oh, no. And they just would get it again and again. Wow. <laughs> um, another thing I wanted to bring up, too. Do I have this right? Your uh, uncle and your father were from Antioch. That's right. Oh, yes. That's where I'm from. Oh, really? Uh, I come from a <laughs> from strong background. Yeah. <laughs> the Yawk, as some people the call yawk, it. The Yawk, yeah. Um, <laughs> so, so, Artie, your father, met uh, Meredith, your mother, um, and they leased the two story building at 895 O'Farrell, which it is today. Uh, well, the Mitchell brothers did, right. They, that was, a, it was an old car dealership. Right. And so they leased it. And that was in 69. Yes. Um, so, And you were born in 70, is that right? Yes. Uh, not to throw your age out there, but so you were born I'm, like... I have no problem. Right when their success started and everything started going crazy, they had you. It hadn't quite gone crazy yet, okay. but they, the, the O'Farrell had opened in the summer of 69, and then I was born summer of 70, so... Things didn't start to really blow up um, until after Behind the Green Door. Which was in 72. 72, 73. So. so you're three, four, five years old, and all of a sudden, maybe you're starting to figure this out? Or was it not till later when you realized, Dad... I, I mean, the, I, at an early age, I had you know an understanding that you know my dad made naked movies, and naked I thought movies. it was really funny. You know, that's, when I was around three to four years old. That's what you would old. think, yeah. yeah. But... Um, so that's when I started to become really aware. I don't think I, I didn't really start to feel stigmatized by it till I was six or so. That's when I started becoming more conscious, conscious uh-huh. that this just didn't feel quite appropriate. Uh, when I'd go to the O'Farrell to, you know, with my dad to go to the office. or <laughs> So you did that. So they, they let you in and you were very much around this whole lifestyle. Right. It's not like I'd go in and watch the shows, but I'd go up up to the office with my dad and the dancer's dressing room was there and there were pictures on the wall and so it was more passive exposure but certainly 
I was aware this was the business. And you were very close with your father and mother. Yes, very different relationships, but um, yes. Uh, and and what about your relationship with your uncle, Jim? Uh, I was never very close to him. Was I mean, so the, the what I know about your father and his uncle is not as much his as his brother. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, your <laughs> uncle. Right. Yes, uh, his brother. Um, are that uh, they, they had a close working relationship, but maybe their personalities didn't mix so well, and they didn't hang out that often. Oh, that's really not the case at all. I mean, later in their life, but they looked and acted like twins, and they were best friends and business partners and really put each other, their relationship with each other above anyone else's for a long time. But towards the end of my father's life... Um, and the, and their career after over twenty five years in the business, things had started to get a bit frayed. Right. So with all the arrests and everything, I mean, tensions were high between the brothers. No, yeah, there was a lot going on. Yes, uh-huh. <laughs> tensions were high. There was, you know, my father was suffering from alcoholism. Um, they were trying to diversify the business and go off into different directions. And uh, I think, you know, there's just a lot of, of various dynamics going on. So let me, if I could, figure out a little bit more about you. Say sure. from age 5 to 15, what was that like growing up? And you're in the Bay Area. You're in high school. People probably know who your parents are, but kids, right. kids are sometimes cruel, but they're also they don't, they're not as judgmental. Well, kids aren't at the elementary age, for Definitely. sure. I, um, I have actually a scene in my play about when I was in fourth grade, and uh, my teacher confronted me and said, so... Is your father one of the Mitchell brothers? And I said yes. And he said, Oh well, I don't go to those types of films. You know, well, either do I. You know, <laughs> yeah. it's like <laughs> either does the rest of the class. But that right. It's like, um, but that's when I it started to really hit that okay, people really judge this, this this isn't cool, and just kind of struck up a lot of fear in me. So after that we went more underground and wouldn't t- tell people what my dad's job was. But I actually went away for high school. I went back east okay. and went to a performing arts prep school near my mom's family from back east. So to, was it partly to get away from that lifestyle that you were being raised around? I, for me, it was an added bonus. Okay. I mean, I really was already very committed and into theater, and it was a great opportunity because of the proximity to family. Um, wasn't that I was like looking for schools necessarily, but once I got that opportunity, I ran with it, and it was that freedom of just. You're like, you know what? No one knows the Mitchell brothers here of my own identity, and I can just kind of find out who I am. So did, was that it for you? You moved out when you were going into high school, went to a different high school, and did you come back? You went to college as well, but did you— uh... I never moved back to the Bay Area. Okay. I mean, I'd come back, obviously, to, with my family. For... But you didn't move back in with your parents or anything like that and live with them? Well, just during, like, spring and summer breaks. and <laughs> You know, I was still a minor. But <laughs> right. but after that, no, I, I didn't. I pretty much never full-time lived with my parents again. So you said you had kind of a fear of the judgment of children and, and people around you. But did, at a certain point, did you kind of respect what was going on and that your father was kind of a pioneer and an it, entrepreneur? I did once I was, like, in college age. Right. I'd, I came around and, again, I'd go through that and that part of my evolution during during my show Mm -hmm. and and did you you i I saw a video where you were discussing the play that's going to be coming up did you uh you visited it kind of as an adult too not just when you were a kid walking through but now you would come with friends and see what was really going on right and was it shocking to you or you must have already known everything uh you know things are always so little shocking but it just it's a different context when you're older and there's peer uh acceptance and mm-hmm. also you know it's nice to have at, at that time i just enjoyed having cocktails and and everything up in the office enjoying the party more than anything you know but it was it was definitely interesting but i wasn't there f- to be titillated personally so. were you ever there when the police came busting in and no okay and but that was my big fear as a young child yeah that dad would get arrested and taken away for good? That I would be there when the cops did a raid and yeah. that I would get put in jail. Right. You know? And in my mind, I didn't, I just, oh, it says under 18, not admitted. Oh, yeah. That means that if the if they come, I'm going to be in trouble. You know, I was just a little kid and didn't get it. You know, but that's also, I was just rather shy. My sister saw the same sign and thought, ooh, that could be kind of exciting. You know, <laughs> so it was just my personality was the oldest child and just, um, you know, I just had a conscience about myself, that right. I was self-conscious about it. Well, with your dad running this business and being so proactive about 
you know, um, the theater and the films. Did your mother kind of try to calm, calm you down and say, hey, you know, you know, it's OK. Your dad's a businessman and things like that. Oh, yeah. You know, and, and my mother um, was for a time she was she uh, was part of the Mitchell Brothers legal team. Oh, wow. And, um, you know, she believed in the in the rights and the, the freedom of expression and everything they defended. But, you know, she kept our lives very separate as well. So as much as possible. Um, so there was, you know, that kind of kept a bit of a kept things a little bit more even keel for mm-hmm. the most part. So you're in college and, you know, you've moved away and I don't know how close you were with your parents at this time, but you probably called and wrote to them. Well, I came back. I went to school at um, USC. Uh-huh. So I moved, went to Los Angeles because by the end of four years in Boston, I was like, later to the snow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I, you know, had, I just, it was kind of a last minute decision, but I ended up going to USC. And so then that, during that period, I really um, kind of rebonded with my dad because uh-huh. I would come up more often to visit. Right. And I had been away at school, you know, and there would go months where I wouldn't see him when I was in, on the East Coast. So that's when I started spending more time, um, you know, coming as a young adult to right. hang out with him, have lunch, go, you know, just hang around the O'Farrell, and it just became a little bit more uh, demystified. Mm-hmm. And you're becoming an adult, and you're becoming an adult, mature. and like the dancers are now my peers, so right. it's a different kind of. That must have been I had friend, I had a friend from prep school who danced at the O'Farrell. Wow. <laughs> You know, just say, but it's it one just of those kind girls of changed. That really, was paying for college. You always yeah. hear that, be like, sure, no, you're not. I've known plenty of them. <laughs> Absolutely, it's it. It is very much a fact that, you know, not just at the O'Farrell, but it's, um, yeah, change. You know, perspective changes when it gets personalized, and you know people, and so things became a little less black and white in my mind as right. I got older. Um, and then, of course, the the ultimate tragedy is your father was murdered by your uncle. Yes. Uh, and you were about 21. I was 20. 20. So, uh, so I mean, that's sad that you were just telling me that you just started, again, rekindling a relationship with your father. Right. And then this happens. And, I mean, I can't even imagine, A, that, you know, just losing a family member in general, but then in a murder, and then my uncle committed to this. I mean, were you right, just was shut so- down for a while emotionally? It, um, you know, I went through a lot. <laughs> uh, obviously, it's... There was the concern also. It was confusing. It was a family member, my uncle. They were so close. There was there's so many um, mitigating factors that were going into my father's state of mind at the time, and you know, we were trying to get him into rehab and to do an intervention. And um, so, of course, it was um, it was surreal. It was surreal uh, that it went down the way it did, and it of course took took a long time uh, how, did, how did your mother react <laughs> oh you know she was devastated as well i mean they had you know they had been um distant for years but had rekindled their friendship and you know in the luckily you know for the few months before he was killed um but it was devastating to to everybody across the board you know uh, Liberty Mitchell Liberty Bradford Mitchell is my guest uh, again everybody go check out these two websites um PD, I'm sorry. PDtheplay.com. PDtheplay.com or zspace.org to get yourself some tickets to uh, to the. Pornographer's Daughter, uh, which takes place from January 17th through the 16th of February. Thursdays, Fridays, and Saturdays and Sundays are the dates that uh, shows will be going on. It's at Z Below at 470 Florida Street. I want to do a quick PSA and play a little video clip that I found of you, which I hope you don't mind. It's not oh, it's not embarrassing at all. Lord help no, us. No, 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 no. <laughs> and we'll be right back. I have many, many more questions for you. It's the top of the hour here on KPOO, San Francisco, 89.5 FM. Two kids, one paycheck. But I'm still going to send them to college. With Sam, I can. Business has fallen off at work, but I'm getting prepared for whatever the future holds. With Sam, I can. I missed a mortgage payment, but now I'm turning things around. With Sam, I can. Making ends meet on a tight budget, coping with job loss, struggling with overwhelming credit card bills. 
Whatever your financial challenge, with Sam, you can. Sam is Smart About Money, a free online resource from the National Endowment for Financial Education. We're an independent nonprofit foundation dedicated to helping people just like you get sound information about money. From everything from how to build an emergency fund to how to deal with job uncertainty, just remember, Sam, I can. SamICAN.org. I'm going to feel in control again with Sam. I can. Get empowered. Reach your financial goals. Visit SamICAN.org. Liberty. A Leo born in San Francisco the summer of 1970. Yes, my parents were hippies who took too much acid before naming their children. My dad was Art Mitchell. His brother Jim and he comprised one of 20th century San Francisco's most infamous duos, the Mitchell brothers. They would emerge as pioneers of the pornography industry when they produced and directed the 1972 Rated X feature, Behind the Green Door. They rode a rags to riches wave from the Cannes Film Festival to First Amendment court battles over the definition of obscenity. The adults in my family were sexual revolutionaries, radical social activists ahead of their time. While it surely was all very cutting edge for the adults on the scene, Growing up the sensitive, dreamy oldest child of the 10 kids in the Mitchell Brothers dynasty had its challenges. My college buddies thought it was awesome that my dad had a strip club. So field trips to the O'Farrell were had. Then my uncle murdered my father. Jim entered my father's house with a rifle and pistol and shot him dead. Dad had nothing in his defense except a half empty bottle of Heineken. Jim received a six-year sentence for voluntary manslaughter, of which he served just under three at San Quentin. After a good decade of bong hits and drama fits, I finally stopped gritting my teeth and began to let my obsession with revenge go. I got married, had kids, and did my best to create a normal family. But something remained unfinished. Seeing my kids grow up awoke deeper truths of the childhood abuses I'd experienced by being exposed to pornography. Unlike my kids, my rearing was far from normal. People have often asked me how I managed to come through relatively sane considering all that went down in my family. I've learned there's a choice to find acceptance and become a survivor or be defined by the horrors in one storyline. All right. Liberty Bradford Mitchell is my guest right now here on KPOO. That was a little video of an online. It was from Kickstarter uh, to get this project going. Uh, Again, her project is uh, a play. It's The Pornographer's Daughter. It's going to be at the Z Below Theater, 470 Florida Street, January 17th through the 16th. Uh, And I keep blowing this. To get yourself some tickets, pdtheplay.com. And that's where you can get some tickets. And we'll give away one pair at the end of the show? Yes. Perfect. Uh, So stay tuned. I'll give out the number in a little bit. Um, Where were we? Where were we? So, yes, unfortunately, your dad was murdered by his brother, uh, your uncle. And that's that kind of made the Mitchell brothers infamous. You know, I'm sure I wasn't uh, around then. No, I'm sorry. I was. Yeah. You were uh, in utero. No, no, no. I'm sorry. I was I was I was old enough to read the newspaper, but I don't remember reading it uh, at the time. But it must have just hit the the news and the, the right it was it made international that. news and i you know of course i'd always been aware that the mitchell brothers my dad had a great presence in san francisco and they were regularly in the herb kane column and but i never had in my mind that the, that that their scope was that large until he was killed and you know across across the globe it was really it was a big story and part of it was the sensational nature but um it just kept going and going and one of the landmark things about his murder was that this was the first time, I don't know how much, how important this is to you, but this was the first time in a uh, trial that they used like video recreated evidence or digitally right. recreated evidence, which now you see on every CSI show mm-hmm. and it's been perfected. But right. so that was the first uh, usage of that. Yeah, ironically, that's, you know, there were film pioneers yet again <laughs> in a very <laughs> It's amazing, way. actually. Uh, one other thing I forgot to mention, everybody that's ever seen a VHS tape or a DVD where it says FBI. FBI copyright, mm-hmm. that was because of your father, because right. at the time, the porn films did not have uh, any copyrights, and I guess a judge 
uh, state judge said that no, they shouldn't have any rights. Your porn films can be um, pirated by whoever. It's right. your fault. But then um, the Supreme Court ruled that, in fact, you have the same rights that any other film distributor. Right. So that's right. very, very cool. Um, what What are some of your favorite memories of your father from your childhood, your adolescence, that people just would never even uh, think about? Like, did you go on a nice family vacation or... Oh, he was a great one for the family vacations, for sure. How's that? <laughs> uh, we used to do a lot of camping with our dad. Really? Like, yeah, we'd go up to uh, Shasta and Tahoe and get the get the houseboats. I was and just going to say, I can't picture <laughs> one of the Mitchell brothers in a tent. Oh, all, no, we do tent camping as well. But you did the well. houseboat and all mm-hmm. that. That's but awesome. Yeah, I know that. I mean, the Mitchell brothers, they lived in a tent as young boys with their family. They were migrant workers before they settled in Antioch, actually. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. So they were actually very well versed in that kind of um, rough living. But then, you know, he was also a great one for, you know, did a lot of skiing and Mexico and Hawaii and, you know, fun stuff. Recreation stuff, like any normal father. Uh, <laughs> I would never say like any normal father, but, you know, we definitely. Uh, had a lot of fun. Uh, we had a big family. He had six kids. I'm the oldest, and we always had a, had a big crew. When we went in somewhere, we definitely made an impact. So, what uh, was your relationship like with the other siblings? Are you still close? Uh, more or less. <laughs> you know, there was a lot of love in our family, but it's you know it's been difficult over the years. We've gone our different ways, but there's a general respect, I believe. And You were the eldest? Yes, still well, am. How uh, young is the youngest? My youngest half-brother was eight when my father was killed. Okay. So he's a 12-year difference. Okay. So, you know. Are you affiliated in any way with the O'Farrell now, or do you steer clear? No, we're not affiliated. We, um, My siblings and I had to sell out our share to Jim a couple years after the murder because I wasn't at the time I wasn't willing to become a business partner. I was by then like 21, 22. It was just, there was just no way. That but I, I mean, do you that. have ill feelings for it? For, for the, the O'Farrell? Yeah. Um, I, would, I wouldn't say ill feelings. I just more neutral. I mean, you know, after my dad died, I went there a few times, but you know, my my cousins run it now, and I have no ill feelings toward oh, okay. them. So okay. it's, you know, it is a business. It's just I... I imagine it must be much more tame than it once was, right? I really the stuff that I've read tell you, but because well, <laughs> I never... haven't been there. But, uh, you know, I don't know. Is it more tame or people are just more... Accepting. More accepting or used to what used to seem shocking is... Yeah. It's true. You know, we look at pictures of, like, early 70s of in... S and M or whatever, and it looks oh how quaint, you know. <laughs> Whereas nowadays, you actually, know. that's a great point. I mean, pornography now, there's some wacky stuff on the web, and it's all accessible. it's ubiqu- it's, it, it's ubiquitous. It's now. One click away now. It's a whole different animal than it was when, yeah. when the Mitchell brothers got into the industry. So. Now your father and your uncle wouldn't even stand out at all for the. Probably not. I mean, they, they would stand out for how tame their stuff is, probably. You know what I'm I mean? I'm sure they would have risen to the challenge yeah. <laughs> to keep up with the times, if, you know. Who knows, but. though? Maybe, I mean, from what I understand, too, um, the Mitchell brothers were very much, they started out, they had a film background, right? Did your dad go to SF State, or was that? My uncle went to San Francisco State okay. and studied film, absolutely. Right. And they did very much come into the industry as you know, trying to break into the avant-garde film scene. And, and Behind the Green Door very much is, you know, has that taste of Fellini or, you know, that late 60s, I need, early I have, 70s. And, I, you know, a lot of people said Eyes Wide Shut was kind of like a blatant ripoff of Behind the Green Door. It's funny. I, I like read articles that like that. I have not Kubrick seen The Green Door. And, um, oh, you haven't? I have not. Why? Well, you should. Well, I did see it when I was in college, and I, you know, was able to tell my dad, I'm like, you know what, Dad, that was a good movie. And he was like, thanks. And he was very pleased. I've that heard I, nothing but good things. You know? I, I mean, oh, it is. I, I mean, Marilyn Chambers is ridiculously beautiful, and it just seems very real. I wonder if it's streaming on Netflix by any chance, or is it too racy? Uh, probably too racy. Okay, you know, I'm gonna get my hands on it. <laughs> Can I pick up a copy at the O'Farrell? Do you think? I'm sure you could. Okay, I haven't visited the O'Farrell either. Well, there, it's it's there. Doors are open. Okay. <laughs> um, let me see here. Yes, yeah, so we talked about uh, – so let's talk about your, your play, The Pornographer's Daughter. It's, it's yes. you explaining 
in much greater detail of what we've talked about your life. Uh, what else am I not getting to? It's, there's documentary aspects to it. You show films. I and show music. some some clips of you know, family clips, whatever. And I also have a three piece band called the Fluffers, and they help track the music from since it spans like the late '60s to more or less present day. Mostly, most of the action goes through the '90s, so they help us keep aware of what time frame we're in and whatnot. And so I'm not, a, it's not a complete one woman show, but it's dramatized. So I'm not but it's just, just you speaking. It's just me speaking for the most part. And besides some of the band, like singing or chiming in a little bit, but it's, it's dramatized. It's not just me sitting at a table. I, I embody different characters from my parents, my uncle, girlfriends, you know, random people. So it's definitely a, a it's a theatrical piece. Is now the... I don't know, the best time for you to come out and do this player, or would you have preferred to do it younger, but you just maybe weren't so comfortable with discussing everything? I started writing this play in 1995 when I was in college at wow. Cornish College of the Arts in Seattle. Almost and 20 years later. <laughs> it's kind of crazy. Well, I mean, and I remember a teacher at the time going, you know, because I was like, I want to finish this by the time I graduate, and you know, which would have been like 90, I graduated in 97. And, uh-huh. Um, <laughs> He said, Liberty, you know, I think you're going to be working on this for years. But yeah, ha- had way. someone said, had someone said, you know, it was going to take that long. Because I know I, I want to get through this. This is part of, you know, it's cathartic, of course, but I want to move on and do other other work. But um, this, I think now is the best time for me to tell the story because, you know, what informed it a lot and what changed a lot in the last 10 years was that I became a mother myself and you know, I became a mother at 31 and, you know, going through the process of raising children and thinking of like, you know, my dad was 24 when I was born. You know, wow. they were young and they were and like you said, it was they were just starting to get successful in this business. And and then it blew up, you know, when I was like three years old, I go, it's, you know, give me some compassion and understanding. I certainly couldn't have before I was a parent myself and just to think of the world that it was a different world. And. You just, it's like rock stars raising kids. Or so, you know, that's just, it's not the normal paradigm, but it gave me a lot more insight to who my parents were. And so I think that it's a more fully formed piece than it could have been if I'd done it when I was 30. Right. From what you've told me here in the past half hour and from what I've read, it sounds like your dad was a good parent, all things considered. <laughs> He was a great person. Right. I wouldn't say he was a great parent no. <laughs> necessarily. I said good parent. A good parent. I mean, there are, there are, he was loving. He wasn't, yeah. I mean, you know, he didn't check in to see how my history report was doing and didn't, you know, have any, you know, anything to do with, with that grades okay or education. With that yeah, okay that would have been okay with you. I mean, his, his advice to me when I came back from prep school, uh-huh. he's like, Liberty, after all those years back east, you're overeducated and uptight because of it. <laughs> You got a party with the frat boys. Like, this is your last chance. You're going to end up a complete square. So, like, his big worry was that I was just going to be too straight, you know? And, wow. Um, so, we go over that in the show. So, yeah, he gave me a lot of uh, counterintuitive uh, fatherly advice. <laughs> Did he have that thing where uh, I think I've seen my father this with the eldest daughter? It's like a very close, like, you know, you could come up and say, Dad, can I have money for blah, 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 or can you take me? Was he like that? He just doting you with gifts and things like that? He was very doting and generous with gifts, for sure. But, you know, th- there were there were pressures. And, you know, I- I'd spent a lot of time away a- in high school. Mm-hmm. Um, but when you, even when we were younger, I mean, it was there was a lot going on. You know, I understand it now. Um, but he was a very, very generous person with not just his children and family, but with friends. And um, he was a very fun person when he was at his best, you know. Um, but he was an alcoholic, and at the end of his life, he was had just really starting to come to terms with that reality, and mm-hmm. had gone so gotten sober. Didn't get sober. He did, he stopped drinking for eleven days, um, just a couple weeks before he was killed. So at the time we were seeking an intervention and whatnot, it was, you know, he he was on the cusp. I think of realizing, you know, he was having, he was forty five years old, and mm-hmm. he was. He was having a midlife crisis. And, you know, he's like, I'm older now. He, he felt much older. He lived a lot more than most. I mean, I'm 43, so it's it's mind-boggling to me to think of the life he'd lived by this point when I feel like, I've only just begun. Right. <laughs> so it's it's interesting. Well, you talk about 
rock stars and I from what I'm told they were friends with the brothers were friends with like Aerosmith and I know Willie Brown went to Jim's funeral and yes um so they were I mean they were a lot of rock stars came to the the club the O'Farrell so, yeah of course uh one of my favorite writers of all time Hunter S. Thompson you didn't have the chance to meet him sadly no yeah maybe that was a good thing <laughs> Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I would have loved to. I mean, I was just as big a fan at that age when I was in college. Of oh, course, wow. we all like Fear and Loathing Las Vegas yeah. was our Bible. You know? Right. But, um, yeah, they were they were good buddies. And he ded- Hunter dedicated, you know, many, several of his books made dedications to the Mitchell brothers in there and or profiled them. So Also, I don't know if uh, Artie directed or Jim directed or how it went down, but the brothers together collectively made a documentary about Hunter S. That's Thompson, right. too. It's half an hour long. The Crazy Never Die. Yeah, and actually that footage has been, I've seen it in other documentaries. It's like some really um, serious footage of Hunter S. Thompson before he you know, got too old. It was like mm-hmm. right in the height of it all. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, Ralph Steadman did an amazing um, poster for that, The Crazy Never Die. It's like Hunter in a Coffin and <laughs> You know, that was about a year or so before my dad um, died. So um, that came, you know, that imagery came to just mean a lot more to all of us. Right. Because it just, it just really embodied the spirit and just the craziness that, you know, these were people who lived a little bigger than the rest of us. <laughs> exactly. A little faster, a little harder. Yeah. Do you know, this is my last question relating to Hunter S. Thompson, but do you know anything <laughs> about, because he's obviously gone now and yeah. uh, this, I'm holding his last book that he wrote while he was alive, but I'm uh, told he's, he's written some good ones since he was dead. No, but there have been some. <laughs> there have been some product like of things course, produced. No, I'm and actually, what Josh, I'm asking yeah. is, uh, there's a there's a several page piece in this book, Kingdom of Fear, called the Night Manager, which is about allegedly he had. Right. What oh, I, I didn't in my opinion, that. it could be the coolest job ever. The Night Manager of the O'Farrell. At Theater. the O'Farrell, yeah. Is this a? Can I apply for this? And can I have Hunter S. Thompson's I think old he, job? Yeah, I think he had a special. He was, he was like a special intern, I believe, I for see. that position. But oh, I'd like to read that. I never. You um, never read. No, I knew. I mean, I knew the Night Manager was like an unfinished book. That, that's that, what I wanted to get to. Do you know if that's coming out? Or do you have any I knowledge? have no idea. Uh, I hope but, so. Um, I know there was a great, another re- great Ralph Steadman. You know they got the picture, they got the poster mm-hmm. done. But yeah, I know I'd love to. I'd love to read those notes for sure. <laughs> well, did you get to meet any of these popular friends that your family had that we were discussing? Aerosmith or did Mayor Willie Brown come over for dinner or anything? Or Marilyn Chambers? You said you met. Uh, well, I knew Marilyn Chambers as a as a young child, right. of course. But no, I I just managed to just kind of. Just about the age I was starting to hang out at the O'Farrell, I just happened to unfortunately miss the rock star nights. And it was like, oh, the chili peppers are here. I'm the like, chili Damn peppers. Damn it. <laughs> wow. But, um, sorry, was that swearing? No, it's okay. Okay. <laughs> but, you know, a lot of people, my, my dad really loves um, the guys from Skid Row. Mm-hmm. <laughs> He loved Sebastian Bach. He just yeah. thought he was like the ultimate rock star. That's so cool. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm sure, you know, strippers and. Rock stars kind of go together, don't I know. they? So. I guess the hard, the hard thing is keeping that lifestyle for 10, 15, 20 years. Yeah, and I know that, I mean, I could. I just know my father was burdened by that at, at that point in time. It was like he wanted to slow down, but his handle was party arty, and, you know, it was kind of the expectation. And I think anyone who's been a hard partier uh, and wants to get out of that um, that kind of mode has a hard time because they don't want to disappoint their friends or feel it's, it's, it's part of the hurdle. Um so we'll never know if he could have got sober. It, it definitely would have been a battle. But you see, like, well, yeah, if Aerosmith could, then my dad could That's have, true. right? <laughs> Keith Richards is still alive. Exactly. So, so you never know. But, um, you know, I've tried to learn from yeah. from those uh, mistakes preemptively and uh, live a healthy lifestyle myself. Would you say that, I mean, I don't know how to ask this. I mean, would do, do you ever forgive your uncle Jim or did you accept it? I mean, did you ever, did you ever speak to him after he came out of San Quentin? No, never after he was out of San Quentin. I saw him maybe, you know, a couple times before that. Um, he never sought forgiveness, which was hard for me for a long time. I really wanted him to, and kind of hoped that my doing a piece of art would evoke that for him. And I finally came to terms with the fact, and it was, I was in my early 30s, and again, already a mother, but um, I realized from my own sanity and happiness that I had to find acceptance. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't quite forgive, 
but you know, I could just accept that there's some things that we never really get the answer to. And I don't think he even, you know, say, why did you kill Artie? You know, it, it could be, a, there could be, a, there's a lot of different things that went into it. He had his own issues with drugs and alcohol too, right? He did in yeah. his past, but he, at the time he killed my father, he was not under the influence. Uh, I've read that they are, that when Artie died in, um, 98, was it? 91. 91, I'm sorry. Uh, that they, um, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Jim. Jim died in, uh, uh, 2000. Okay. Seven? Oh, 2007, wow. I okay. believe, yeah. When he did pass away, though, they, they buried him in Lodi next to your father. Right. So, any thoughts on that? I mean, I mean, they had obviously their arguments, but they were brothers and, you know. They were. And, you know, the the um, the phrase that really drives, the quote that really is inspired and drives my play is the truth is rarely pure and never simple. Oscar Wilde. Yes. And that quote has given me a lot of solace over the years. You know, and it is no easy thing to try to forgive. But at the same time, like I just, you know, life's too short. There's mm-hmm. no time to hate anybody <laughs> i feel you know it's just not worth long term because uh, yes i mean obviously there's you could say i deserve to there could be good reason but at the end of the day it's like the way it was Im- impacting my soul it's like i, I don't want to live like this and i wanted to get on living in the present in my life so that's what i've done <laughs> and one final thing that kind of wraps that up that you you know helped yourself is that you are a yoga instructor Yes. And uh, where, where can people take lessons with you? Or uh, Privately now. Privately? <laughs> for now, I've had to give up since I've started this show and uh-huh. whatnot, but I used to teach at the Y. Oh, wow. <laughs> for six and a half years, had a wonderful class and devoted students. But yes, I teach kundalini yoga. What is that? And kundalini, it's... I've done yoga before, but it's always the... They call oh, it the... yoga flow or vinyasa flow. Mm, yeah, that's I feel like, like I'm doing jumping that's like, jacks. That's like the Yankee version It's not. Of I knew yoga. it wasn't real, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you can find some. Well, in fact, my uh, my Kundalini yoga instructor she teaches in in San Francisco. But just look it up. Look at uh, Kundalini Research Institute. Um, you learn all about it. A lot of breath work. It's uh, that's the key. Yes. Yeah. And and anyone can do it. That's that's the other thing about Kundalini. You're not like tied into the down dogs and. Uh huh. Power yoga. Not that there's anything wrong with that. That's I've, enjo- what, I've enjoyed kind of my gone. Brian Kest in my day. Believe me. Yeah. But. Um, Kundalini, I, I started practicing yoga actually the summer after my father was killed. I spent in Boulder, Colorado. Oh, wow. And that's when I took my first yoga class at the Naropa Institute, which is Allen Ginsberg's college that he founded. No way. Really funky place, yeah. So I tried that there, and it just became, you know, a lifelong partner, shall I say. And it's been a very key part of my healing and recovery from this trauma and just, you know, getting through the day without wanting to rip my hair out. So would you <laughs> say days, you do anyway. you do yoga, you practice every day? I practice some breath work meditation every day. Okay. No, I sadly do not. But again, being a mother of two, you know, elementary age children has its uh, constrictions, but I'd love to. <laughs> your children are old enough now to know the the whole story of your grandfather. My my daughter is yes she's um, she's twelve my son's eight it's still very how much did over you, his head do you bring it up much or I mean will you ever she take was, him by the O'Farrell on the outside and say you know your father built that no I haven't shown uh, we that. haven't you know we we live in Southern California so we're not up here that often um, so no she's never seen the actual building but you know it's just very recently that we've begun to have conversations and. Um, you know, she's very astute, and you know, most importantly, when she started asking me about sex when she was eight years old, mm-hmm. you know, we were able to start talking about what that is. You know, so she's like, "Well, sex is a means to, you know, that's true, create a baby." Did and your parents ever have that conversation? No, ironically, like, no, no one ever. That's the other yeah. thing. Like, no one ever talked to me about sex. <laughs> it's like shoemakers' children go barefoot. So, which <laughs> was part of the confusion of here's this imagery all around me, and no one's talking about it. In relation to my own just sexual development, for them, right? Right, and I know, and believe me, I've known plenty of people who've worked in the industry get very inured to it, which yeah. I, I totally get that. But yeah, as parents, it's kind of like it was still, you know, in the '70s. It wasn't. I think some were transitioning to telling kids way too much information, and, yeah. but still, some was, you know, like my mom was raised a wasp; she was never given a talk. Mm-hmm. So it just kind of continued along that vein. But yeah, the the context of what I was surrounded with wasn't 
really put in a way that I could digest at that age. So it was important to me to kind of start these conversations as they organically came up with my my kids. So we're on our way. <laughs> well, Liberty, thank you so much. I mean, we spent nearly an hour. Uh, it was a pleasure to speak with you. Liberty Bradford Mitchell, playwright and performer. Uh, the world premiere of The Pornographer's Daughter is going to be at Z Below. That's on 470 Florida Street. Get, get some tickets at pdtheplay.com, zspace.org. Uh, I'm going to give away one pair in a couple minutes. And um, yeah, January 17th through the 16th. Are you nervous? Uh, no, I'm I'm so excited. Good. We have an amazing team, and my director Michael T. Weiss has just been outstanding. He's really taken this long held vision to a whole nother level. So that's great. I can't wait to see it. Well, thanks, Derek. It's Thank been you delightful. so much for coming in. Thank you. All right, I'm going to go to another quick word here about uh, our radio station. When I come back, I'll have some more blues music for you, and I will be uh, taking off at about 4 p.m. today. I got an extra hour this week, which was uh, very nice to have. So uh, thank you so much, Liberty. And uh, we're going to have some more music coming up in just a minute. You're listening to KPOO San Francisco 89.5 FM. KPOO, Poor People's Radio. KPOO serves the underserved, a service that is more than well-deserved. From the time it was conceived over 40 years ago, it has always had a mission to be the people's radio show, community-supported, not distorted. Staffed by volunteers, from board members to announcers, with a thin workforce to hold it all together and keep us on the air, our mission clear, serve the underserved, a powerful minority presence and advocacy, the people's choice in radio. It has always been Poor People's Radio, a sympathetic voice, a point of view that is independent, not bought by commercial entities, news reported fairly and honestly, community supported, not distorted. Time to support this free voice to maintain the people's choice. Reach deep, it will make you feel so good as supporting any good cause would. Support the volunteers of KPOO and the People's Choice in Radio. This is Clemente, your poet of politics.